readers, listeners, I'm so glad you've tuned in. Welcome to the Fox page where we dive deep into the very best books. You'll come away with a better understanding of the text at hand, all while learning to read everything a little better. I'm so excited about today's episode. So um, Demon Copperhead is one of these books that has been floating around for a while. And for whatever reason, I was a little resistant. And then um, my sister was like, I don't know, almost done with the book and was like, turns out it is a rewriting of David Copperfield, which she had not realized. And then uh, my ears perked up a little. I am not actually a Dickens fan. We were made to read uh, Charles Dickens over the summer at my all-girls school, which, I mean, go figure. Like, I'm not sure why 500 pages about a boy is the right thing for a bunch of girls to be reading. Uh, I also found out at that point that Dickens was paid by the word. And so the teenager in me was just like, this was just a guy trying to make a buck. But later in life, I realized, in fact, that Dickens is his own kind of genius, and I love any good attempt at a rewriting. So I dove into The King Solver and really found myself so incredibly moved by what Barbara King Solver has done. So I'm not going to argue that you need to understand Dickens or that you have to be like fully acquainted with David Copperfield in order to get the most out of Demon Copperhead. But I will say that having even kind of a rudimentary understanding of David Copperfield and of Dickens will really help you uh, just appreciate the accomplishment that King Solver has, has achieved here. And also, I think to more completely, um, you know, really take in this very important message because not only is this a very skilled rendering and like an incredibly uh, thorough and incredibly inventive re rewriting of David Copperfield, but it is also just one of the best matched sort of rewriting of a classic, sort of best matched kind of classic and contemporary bestseller in terms of really using the source material to really, um, you know, create the best novel in the present day that you can and to really sort of drive home the message of that novel. So if David Copperfield was really, uh, you know, a book that was writing against institutional poverty and the plight of children in that system, then Demon Copperhead is just, I'm going to keep stumbling over Demon Copperhead and David Copperfield. Um, for the entire time that we are together today. Just prepare yourselves. But honestly, um, Demon Copperhead is just an absolute incredible uh, look at the plight of people during the opioid ep epidemic. And if King Solver had to find you know, source material to sort of uh, bolster and frame her story, she could not have found a better uh, you know, sort of template and a better kind of master to emulate. And she could not have done, in my opinion, a better job. Okay. So, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the reasons why at first I was maybe hesitant. Um, one is that a rewriting of David Copperfield, part of me was like, do we need, I mean, my ears perked up for sure when my sister said that, but then I was like, do we need another rewriting of a classic? Like, I'm just not really sure that we did. Although I really loved Curtis Sittenfeld's rewriting of, I believe it's Pride and Prejudice or maybe Emma. It's called Eligible. It actually takes place in my hometown of Atherton. So Atherton, California. And boy, she did such a good job. I have it right here. I'm glancing to my left. And for those of you who are not watching the YouTube channel, you will um, be missing out the fact that I was looking for something that I could wear that was like very Dickensian. And I was like, I'm not going to find anything really Dickensian in my closet. And then um, turns out my husband, Bill, gave me the most incredible, it's a coat actually, but I wear it as a dress and I literally look like I just walked out of Oliver Twist or maybe not that, maybe Great Expectations. Anyway, check out the YouTube channel to uh, get a good gander at, at my uh, Dickensian outfit. But I was like, do we need another rewriting of a classic? I am not sure that we do. I also was thinking to myself, this is territory that has been pretty deeply mined no pun intended there, um, this, this mining territory of, of Virginia and of that part of the, of the country, of the South. We had Hillbilly Elegy. We have lots of um, 
I actually did not read Hillbilly Elegy, but I have heard from some people that they felt like this was kind of mining the same territory. Um, for whatever reason, I was just really not wanting to watch Dope Sick and, and sort of that rash of movies that came out about the opioid crisis. So I had this sense that, that quite a bit had been written about it and, and was just kind of wondering if I really wanted to dwell in that world. And then, of course, finding out that... Um, that that world is also 550 pages. And honestly, I am so impressed that Barbara Kingsolver has gotten so many Americans to dive into a hardcover book. And you all know how I feel about that. If you're like, oh my God, it's $27. You know, just amortize, amortize all those dollars over all of the hours that you will enjoy and you will find out it is a bargain. Um, or get it on Audible or wait for the paperback or get it from your library, whatever you want to do. Um, but I, I did feel like, wow, this is a long book. And yet so many Americans have really, you know, do dived, dove, dove, dived in. They have dived in and have really enjoyed it. So I bought myself a copy of the King Solver novel and was absolutely floored. Not only was I incredibly impressed just with the novel of on its own, but I really, like all of these kinds of David Copperfield and all of these sort of Dickens elements jumped out at me in a way that was not obtrusive at all. It was just like genius. So I had reread David Copperfield um, when I was doing my three quarters of my MFA program before I dropped out of Bennington and um, read it with David Gates, the inimitable professor there, teacher there, David Gates, absolutely loved Dickens for the first time in my life. And I just, I, you know, you all know my shitty memory, but all of this David Copperfield stuff came back. And again, I will tell you, you don't need to have read David Copperfield to really be impressed by uh, King Solver and to really love this book. But I think that understanding some of the elements will make you uh, love Demon Copperhead even more than you already do. Or it will convince you to read it if you have not yet. Okay, so I want to, um, we're going to go back. So uh, David Copperfield was published in 1850, but we're going to go all the way back to about 1554. So 1554, middle of the 16th century in Spain, you have the publication of this novel called Lazario de Tormes. So it was published, um, we don't know who wrote it. Uh, it, was not, it was not published anonymously. We just are not sure really who wrote this thing. Um, and Lazario de Tormes, I think you would say maybe Lazario, Lazario de Tormes, um, is a picaresque novel. It's really the first and best example of the picaresque novel. Um, we also had shades of this in Boccaccio and shades of this in Chaucer, but really this picaresque novel comes into its own uh, in 1554 with Lazario de Tormes. Um, so in this kind of picaresque novel, this is going to sound familiar if you have already, uh, you know, dove, dived into um, uh, uh, demon, Copperhead. One is that the protagonist is generally uh, of a lower class, has some criminal elements, but like endearing criminal elements. It's kind of like, not exactly a Robin Hood, but like certainly someone where you're like, go ahead, Lazario, and steal that pun. Go ahead, just take that little that little bolito de pan and steal it for yourself because you deserve it because the system is screwing you. So you have this protagonist who's from a lower class, and is uh, has some, maybe some criminal elements, but is also a revolutionary. This is someone who is, um, you know, optimistic from the start, a little mischievous from the start. So pícaro in Spanish means rascal. That's kind of a good uh, approximation for it. So this idea of kind of like a rapscallion or a rascal is, is what the picaresque novel is all about. So you've got this kind of somewhat revolutionary, um, you know, person who's ready to kind of challenge the system, not in big ways, but in very small ways. The picaresque novel is also built on a first person narrator. It's usually a young boy. And although you have this idea of like a young boy turning into a man, it's usually not a hero's journey. And it is not um, like a building's roman. It's not like the, the evolution of a young man toward like some honorable manhood um, it, or young boy toward manhood. It is more this idea that this is a young person who is born, again, this will sound familiar if you're reading The King Solver, uh, a young man or a young 
an infant who is born uh, with optimism and with intelligence and with resourcefulness and with a good heart. And that little baby who is good in all of these ways is just going to get shit on again and again and again. And this little boy turned teenager turned man is is not going to change in super appreciable ways, but is really going to push against the system in ways um, that, that you are cheering for him the whole time. So you have this downtrodden, um, low class, quote unquote, low class protagonist. You have a first person narration that is told from the perspective. That's all that means told from the perspective of that boy. I did this. I did that. Um, you have this, uh, you, you don't have so much plot. So again, it's not like a big character arc where there's going to be some, you know, rising action and some climax and then some, um, you know, uh, like falling off action in a denouement instead of like a plot that's all moving toward one big character arc you're going to have a lot of digression and it's going to feel very episodic. So it's, you know, imagine Lazarillo or Demon or David Copperfield in, in each of these kinds of ch chapter long episodes where he, because it is a boy, of course, is getting into kind of one adventure after the next, but it's they are not relying on each other. You could essentially take any one of these, uh, you know, episodes and, and pull it out and it almost stands alone as an adventure. And lots of them are proving the same thing over and over that, that David slash um, Demon slash Lazarillo are these like resourceful, relatively good hearted like downtrodden kids who are having to really um, pit their their good qualities against a system that is working against them. Okay, and then um, you have this idea of realism. So you don't have as much of it in Lazarillo de Tormes because it was a long time ago. That would have been more, um, you know, you maybe didn't have quite the level of detail that we have later with Dickens and certainly that we have also in The King Solver. So you don't have quite the level of realism, but again, you have enough to know that Lazarillo, even in 1554, was, was kind of a rapscallion. And um, you also have an element of satire. So all of that is in the picaresque novel, uh, the protagonist, the first person narration, the young boy, the episodic narration, um, the idea that there is not a huge arc and not, some, not lots and lots of growth, and uh, this idea of, of realism and, and a little bit of satire. Satire simply meaning that you are pointing out societal ills, oftentimes exaggerating them, with the idea of, of making society better. Okay, so that is the picaresque novel. And some of you maybe are thinking, like, what about Don Quixote? And that's a very good question. Anyone out there, gold star, A plus for today, if you were thinking of um, Cervantes, Cervantes, and Don Quixote. But that is an example of, of a send up or a satire of the chivalrous novel. So that was from a romance novel um, sort of model, because of course you have Don Quixote who's in love with Dulcinea, and, and it's all this sort of imaginative stuff about how he will win her heart. There are absolutely picaresque elements, but we don't see a lot of the other, um, you know, a lot of the pieces that are the real backbone of what Dickens is doing and what this author uh, in Spain in 1554 was doing. Um, you know, Cervantes published uh, Don Quixote in 1605. So this is predating Don Quixote by about 50 years. So you have the picaresque in Don Quixote in terms of the episodes and kind of this episodic narration, these different adventures that he is having and the idea of digression. But you don't have um, the same idea of a young child growing into a man and uh, a lot of the other issues um, that we uh, see in the picaresque novel, we don't quite see in this Don Quixote, which is the send up of the chivalrous novel. OK, so um, very quickly, I want to um, talk about Demon Copperhead as a picaresque novel. So of course we have Demon, um, who is our protagonist. He is definitely telling his story from the first person. And he is revolutionary in, in a very quiet kind of Lazarillo kind of way, simply in that he is, he is um, you know, working against a system or at a very, you know, minimum is, is pointing out the issues in the system that are not working for him. So King Solver has these excellent, um, you know, sort of paragraphs or even sentences 
sentences where very plainly she states the ways in which the system, whether it is, you know, these horrendous pain, um, you know, management facilities and these horrendous, she talks about Purdue at one point and falsifying information and this, this system and, it, you know, preying on people who are getting their disability checks. Um, so King Solver is very clear about the ways in which the system is not working for this population. Um, we also, of course, have the young boy growing up into a man. Um, both David Copperfield and Demon uh, Copperhead uh, were born with a call. So you have this idea of them being born inside the amniotic sac and the idea of them as not being, uh, you know, they won't, they won't ever drown. Which in fact is is metaphorical for the idea of them both having this kind of irrepressible optimism that really works in Demon's favor and also in David's. But you don't have this idea of like um, it, it, there's not a gigantic character arc where Demon is like some asshole in the beginning and then he learns a bunch of stuff and ends up being a better person. In fact, he is born with a lot of the good qualities that we see later. Some of this is helped by the idea that this is a retrospective uh, first person narration. So he's writing this from a point in the future. Um, and so we see some of those good qualities, you know, that are sort of um, he's he's picking them out for us in a certain way as an adult. But you see them even from the beginning. He's very, you know, he's a good friend to Maggot and he is a good son to his mother. And you have all of these things that are, are very good about him in the beginning. And he retains those even as the system just continually shits on this poor boy. Um, we definitely have him as this low social class, much like Lazarillo. And we also have certain criminal elements. You know, he when he is with Dory, they are certainly not always acting within the law or um, ethically. I mean, they're stopping short at stealing stuff, but really mostly because they know they will get caught because unlike Maggot, they're not particularly good at stealing from Walgreens. So you have this idea of them as working against a system, but it's kind of criminal light because they are not, in fact, you know, it's not big crimes. And it's also, it's that ethical thing where you absolutely want them to work against the system because it is, in fact, pitted so uh, sharply against them. You do have this idea also of this episodic plot. You know, you could really take one of these phases of, of uh, Demon's life when he's with the macabres, which is, you know, it's it's a direct sort of translation of um, David Copperfield's time with Mr. Macabre and Mr. Macabre's family. So you have these episodes that happen in his life, you know, then he moves on, he has his terrible stepfather, and then he moves on to, uh, you know, the school at, at Creaky, and then he has the macabres, and then he has, um, you know, his time in the, in the castle with Coach. So you have these episodes in his life that you could essentially pop any one of those out and it would be fine. The, the, the narration would sort of still move forward. You'd lose some detail, of course, and some nuance, but essentially each one of these is testing the same set of values and is kind of proving the same thing about him. So, and then of course we have a lot of excellent realism. Realism was something that Dickens um, and, and Flaubert in France, they were really the, the sort of masters of realism. And we're gonna talk about realism in a minute, but one of the hallmarks of it is this idea of presenting the reader with a world in which the reader can become immersed. And one of the main ways that writers do that is with lots and lots of detail. And we certainly have that here with King Solver. She is just, you know, the details are so, so well chosen and so well, um, you know, I mean, that's part of the reason why it's 550 pages long is it's just absolutely just a treasure trove of all of the details that really make this uh, world come to life. Okay. So this is a very good segue into realism. So again, realism was kind of Dickens's bread and butter. Uh, it was also Flaubert. So Madame Bovary was published in 1856. Uh, David Copperfield a little earlier than that in 1850. So, but right in the kind of middle of the 19th century during the Victorian era in England, you have this um, realist novel, which was very, um, it, it was a socialist, not a socialist. It was a social movement in many ways. It wasn't socialist, maybe, but it was definitely democratic. So realism involves a lot of detail, which I just mentioned, but it also involves some other things, one of which is kind of this democratic uh, kind of mission that instead of talking, I mean, 
I think uh, you can look at Jane Austen as kind of a bridge, but instead of looking at some of the enlightenment texts, you know, and these kind of theoretical, um, you know, kind of high flying um, pieces of writing from the 18th century, think 1700s, think, um, you know, uh, enlightenment stuff. Um, and instead of biographies and all of that kind of thing, um, we have, in fact, these novels that seek to create a world and, and they seek to create that world by really, um, you know, loading up on the detail. They also are seeking to, like, you know, sort of furnish us with a world that is very democratic in the sense that um, with Madame Bovary, we're talking about the petit bourgeoisie. And, and with Dickens, we're talking about sort of lower class English, you know, that that stratum of England, the one where, you know, the kids are working in the factories. Um, this is a little before the Industrial Revolution, um, but, but not much. You know, you're kind of leading up toward that. So there's this democratic push to show the plight of every man. We are not talking about, you know, um, the royalty anymore. We are not talking about scientific ideas. We are talking about the plight of, uh, of children and of, of young people and of old people. And again, th this kind of uh, democratic element of realism means that we're concerned with things like, what are they eating? Where did they go to the bathroom? What do their underwear look like? So we're kind of pulling back the, um, you know, you don't see as much of that in Jane Austen, for example, because you have that kind of, that comedy of manners, you know, that ends with a marriage, um, usually, if it's, you know, happily ever after. But we're not learning a ton about, you know, what Emma, you know, like where she's shitting. Like, basically, it's like realism is like, wait, Let's just get to the full underbelly here and talk about progress. For example, in Madame Bovary, there's a lot of concern about whether scientific medical progress is heading in the right direction or not. So the, the, the realist novel is starting to really uh, test these theories. For example, is, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of foster care system in England in 1850, how's that going? turns out it was not going that well. So you wanted to to sort of take a, well, it didn't always begin with an idea, I don't think, because novels that begin with ideas like that, like with a thesis, generally do not end up being, um, you know, great literature. But part of what Dickens is doing here, David Copperfield, by the way, being his high, most autobiographical novel, it's highly autobiographical, his own story of his father, I think going to debtor's prison when cute little Charles was 12 and, and just all of the kind of um, reversal of fortune that ensued for him and, and some really, really difficult uh, poverty that he goes through. So you have this democratic ideal of realism, which is to show the middle class and lower classes and, and to really show the sort of plight of people who were facing very severe uh, poverty. You still do have some satire and some irony in these worlds and in realism, uh, but that is a little later in naturalism when we get much more of kind of a, a political bent where we have more satire that comes with like Emile Zola and things like Les Miserables, that kind of um, like slightly more political, more kind of on the nose uh, critiques of society that come with the realist type novel, but pushed a little bit further toward the political. Okay, so um, a couple of things about Dickens in particular, not just realism. So I think a lot of you are aware, as I was painfully back in high school, the Dickens works were serialized. And what that meant is that they would come out, you know, like, I think it's like every few months, almost sort of quarterly is how we would think about it now. So a lot of the stories, the reason why they are episodic is because they would come out in these serials. So you would have kind of the idea of like a, like a, almost like a short story or a chapter, but it would need to be able to stand alone. It would need to be kind of a contained narrative uh, th that would have a very satisfying mini arc for your reader. So it, the fact that it was serialized um, made also some of the conventions of needing to uh, kind of repeat different things. So Kingsolver does a very good job of this. There's some sort of little recaps that happen, and, and that's a very Dickensian thing. It's sort of like, oh, you know, now that I'm with Dory, I'm remembering how shitty it was to be with my terrible stepfather and blah, 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 and all of this, you know, sort of like running back through a little biography. It's also helpful, just practically speaking, when we are reading Copperhead, because it's 550 pages long, 
And if you're not reading like two or three hours every morning, like I do, um, it's going to take a while to get through that sucker. If you're listening, it's like, I don't know, 22 hours or something. I like the audio version. Um, it's not the voice that I had in my head. I, I don't, I don't love it as much as the voice that was in my head. I had a very male voice, but it was a little wiser and a little lower, in fact, than the voice that is reading Copperhead. Um, but but I really, I, I, I love listening to books. And I, you know, for those of you who are out there listening, awesome. Keep at it. This is a long one, bit of a long one. So when there are those recaps, it is very helpful. So you have this serialized novel. It was published in 1854 as a book, but... The fact that it was serialized and sort of um, released in, in episodes does explain a lot about the structure. Um, you have this idea of social injustice in both books. And again, for, um, for Dickens, this was a very important element of David Copperfield. And my understanding is that Barbara Kingsolver read um, David Copperfield or reread it, I'm sure, and was really struck with all of the ways in which we have not come very far. And that's something we're going to return to in the end today. But honestly, if you're, I've been thinking about this so much, if you're Barbara Kingsolver and you're reading about the plight of David Copperfield, it would feel so um, sort of immediate and so urgent because you would see, you know, she's from Kentucky, you would see people in your midst who are in that exact same plight. And, and I think it would have been very powerful for her to, to have a sense of wanting to revisit and, and to sort of reimagine this, uh, you know, this formula that worked incredibly well for Dickens and, and is working very well for King Solver as well. Okay. And then, um, in Dickens, there is this classist thing. So we're seeing um, in Dickens, we see a pretty broad range of classes, but there definitely is a focus on, uh, you know, lower classes. You think of Pip and you think of Oliver Twist and you think of, uh, you know, these different characters who are really the heart and soul of these books. And yet they, um, you know, they, they kind of, they're able to sort of uh, move in and out of these different uh, milieu, as it were, back in England. Remember, we're talking about Dickens now, not uh, not King Solver as much. Um, so another couple of Dickens elements, and these are much more sort of Dickensian than they are realist elements. One is this idea um, in Wikipedia. I love reading Wikipedia to like, I mean, I have a very like entrenched and, and I think a very nuanced and, and a very kind of um, well-worn definition of realism. What with having having a PhD in literature. I just, I'm just going to toot my own horn here a little bit, but I'm also building credibility with you people. Um, I, I like reading the Wikipedia because I like imagining all of those people kind of going through and rewriting and writing. And, um, and, and a lot of times it's so good and it's really very educative for me, but I liked it. Somebody was talking about, um, I think it was like repulsively likable characters in Dickens. And it was such an apt phrase. I wrote down repulsive characters, which, and I have it in quotations. I feel like it was even more nuanced than that. But this idea of repulsive characters is so Dickensian. And he's not the first to do this, obviously. But there are some incredibly memorable people like Uriah Heep, who is the precursor to U-Haul um, who in, in Demon. Um, these repulsive characters are incredibly memorable. So... I mean, it really comes from again the detail. So you have these these details that are that are um, you know very sticky. You're remembering, for example, in Demon Copperhead, there are lots of examples of kids with not lots, but there's some examples of kids with terrible acne and. Uh, King Solver has great descriptions of that. And if you think about, you know, think about A Christmas Carol, um, you know, with these ideas of these ghosts and how sort of disfigured these kind of um, spirits are, or, or the, you know, the crushing depiction of people who are downtrodden by poverty and really a lot of his different works. So this idea of these repulsive characters is a very kind of Dickensian thing. Also, a very Dickensian thing that you probably uh, are aware of or is this idea of, of unique names. So names, um, you know, like uh, Mr. Sloppy or um, I can't even read my, oh, Tolly, Polly, Polly, mm, Polly Toodles is the name that I have written down here um, or Mr. Buzzfuzz. So these are names that, you know, to an American ear, you're like, I don't know. 
maybe there are people in England named Mr. Buzzfuzz. But in fact, um, I did some reading on this, and there are not a lot of Buzzfuzzes walking around England. There are not a lot of Mr. Sloppies, and there are not a lot of Polly Tootles. Um, so y you take, I think what he's doing here is he's taking names that sound, you know, like they might be... Um, you know, sort of an English E sounding, but he's definitely pushing them toward the absurd in ways that are very, very meaningful. So you can imagine that Mr. Sloppy is very different than Uriah Heap, you know, or Mr. Creaky, which is, you know, a nickname uh, that they come up for, uh, come up with in um, in Demon Copperhead, you know, and, and I think King Solver does a very good job of supplying them with nicknames as kind of a workaround in David, in um, David Copperfield and in most of Dickens, he just goes right for it. You know, you have um, Mr. Micawber, um, you have uh, Miss Havisham, those are actually somewhat more, um, you know, kind of believable names. But this idea of these very Dickensian names, it's, it's almost like Beatrix Potter, you know, like a Jemima Puddle Duck, that kind of thing. Um, you have these names that are unique, but also very telling. So I love that element. And I love the fact that each of these names, you know, if it's someone who's sinister, they're really sinister. An example is Mr. Scrooge. You know, I mean, it's just like, it's so good. It's so good, in fact, that we now, like, you know, a Scrooge and, you know, Bah Humbug, all of that has become, you know, sort of synonymous with someone who is, in fact, very tight-fisted and cruel and unthinking. Um, and then you have Tiny Tim, you know? Like, it's just, you have these really, I could go on for a long time about the sort of etymological reasons why Tiny Tim, in terms of vowels, is very different than Scrooge vowels and consonants both. Um, I, I will not do that because we're not going to dig into that level today. But suffice to say that Dickens is very good at names and is very famous for sort of these outrageous names that are in fact very telling and that fit very sort of neatly into this world that he has created, which is a teeny bit absurd, but also really pointing out the fact that that this kind of crushing poverty or these kinds of uh, reversals of fortune that people were suffering, you know, in, in the Victorian era in England are absurd. A lot of this is absurd. And, and a lot of the, the book is David Copperfield trying to make sense or, or at least, you know, make peace with some of life's absurdities. OK. So I want to talk very briefly about why the Kingsolver book is, in fact, very Dickensian. One, of course, is that it's really long. This is a long, epic book. If you are reading it or you have read it, um, congratulations. That's really, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to find time to read these days, what with everything competing for our attention. But it's even harder to tackle a 550-page book. If you are considering reading it and haven't yet, I can tell you that thing hums along. I mean, you... I'm not a particularly fast reader, especially when the prose is is so beautiful and so rich. Um, but but it really did seem to fly right by. Um, the idea of the first person retrospective narrator, obviously we have that with Demon, and it's really beautifully done because he, th this retrospective narrator narrator is talking from uh, you know some point in the in the future, and yet we do have this sense of of real childlike wonder um, from the beginning. There's a lot of versatility in the same way that we see in David Copperfield. Um, again, with with Demon Copperhead, you don't have quite you don't have like a typical arc or a typical coming of age kind of um, adventure story. In fact, we have these episodes and it's very much like the book is serialized. I think you could actually put this down for a couple of months and come back to it and read a new uh, kind of episode, a new chapter in, in the sort of metaphorical sense, read a new chapter, uh, uh, you know, in Demon's life and you'd be pretty well situated. You know, you'd, you'd be pretty comfortable in terms of your footing. Um, we do have these repulsively strange characters. They're so, she does such a good job with, um, with making U-Haul really creepy in, in lots of the ways that Uriah Heep is creepy. So there's like this, the way that he moves and, and, and physical features, but also, um, this kind of reptilian sense of both of them, which is so well done. But even with Dory, you know, you have this real association with her because of this hair that, that if I'm remembering correctly, and I'm literally still reading, well, I'm done with the book now, but I like just finished it. Um, 
this idea of her hair, I think it's shaved on one side and long on the other, but it's dyed um, kind of an orchid color. It's, um, you know, a few years ago, that like kind of grayish hair on young people that was then like lavender and pink and all those colors. Um, that's kind of what I was imagining. And in my mind, um, and he gives her the orchid at that one point, um, in my mind, she is very much associated with an orchid and I see her as an orchid. I mean, what a, what a cool thing because she is also kind of like that. She's kind of ornamental and, um, and very pretty and exotic for him and interesting uh, and kind of solitary. There are lots of ways in which she is very much like an orchid. So it's, it's very much to King Solver's credit that we are seeing these people much like we would have seen in Dickens, um, you know, where Tiny Tim is all about his little crutch and, um, you know, sort of that one element that, that really becomes a very um, strong uh, association that, that really kind of plays on our heartstrings in all the right ways. We, of course, have class exploration. I mean, this is, you know, King Solver is really very clear about the fact that she is writing about the plight of these people. The book is, is um, you know, dedicated to the survivors. So she really is is speaking to the urgency of, of this moment. And she's created this novel that is, I think, such a testament and such an effective way of really immersing us in the problem and in the urgency of this problem and, frankly, the injustice. Okay, so um, with Demon Copperhead, though, we have this, um, this incredible kind of rewriting of David Copperfield, but the last thing I want to do is talk about, I want to sort of take it one step further, like, okay, so what? It's a rewriting of David Copperfield, big deal. Well, it turns out that it's a very, um, very kind of important instantiation of this long, long, you know, at least 500 year literary tradition. And it is such a beautiful manifestation of that. I was so moved by this idea that, you know, we have these classics that have endured for 500 years, like Lazarillo de Tormes, or like um, Don Quixote, or like, um, you know, uh, David Copperfield, or Madame Bovary. These, these, the, this long line in this kind of picaresque slash realist tradition. And this is such an incredible addition to that. I love this idea of, it's not a dialogue, this idea of these sort of conversations, this kind of... Um, you know, movement through time. And the reason why that is so moving to me is this idea of, of humanity and this idea of literature as this magical way to understand humanity, whether it's looking at life in 1850 in England uh, in the lower classes or whether it's a way of, of framing and understanding and sympathizing with the opioid epidemic in 2023 in the United States. It's such a miracle. I mean, writing and, and novels in particular, fiction, it's just an absolutely incredible way for humanity to sort of mark these moments when, when we really are in crisis. Um, I, I just found it, I found it so beautiful. I also, though, found it so apt because, again, the structure of this novel is this kind of episodic thing. And the, that's the structure of Lazarillo, it's the, it's the structure of David Copperfield, and the structure of Demon Copperhead. And that episodic thing um, is, is cool. Like it's doing a lot of different work in that, we, you know, we have these different adventures and it's, it's exciting and it allows it to be serialized and all that. But it's more important than that, which is the following. The bigger takeaway is that when when these babies are born, they all happen to be men, but when these babies are born, they are born already with goodness and with resourcefulness and with warmth and with compassion. And each one of these episodes is testing that. And in each one of them, you know, our heroes, despite kind of what is happening in their lives, they are able to maintain, you know, this optimism and this resilience and this determination and this loyalty and, and, and this curiosity and wonder. So this idea that, that, that this episodic thing, like that they keep getting tested in similar ways, is so good because it's talking about preserving that goodness with which every human is born. It is also, and this I just think is so genius on King Solver's part, it is also a testament to just the relentlessness of poverty 
and the the relentlessness of working in a system that is shitting on you, a system that is absolutely designed to take advantage of your difficulties and to not better them and to keep you in the place where, you know, in this case, the big pharma is making uh, money. So this idea of of this episodic uh, novel that King Solver chose as her model and her scaffolding is so good because not only is it preserving this notion of of, of sort of, um, you know, people being good, fundamentally good, but also this idea of the relentlessness of these kinds of systems. So, and then um, th- this idea too of the um, of, of this first person narration is also so important. It's important in Lazarillo and in David Copperfield and again in Demon because we're hearing the voice of someone who is normally not heard. I mean, this is a voice that is not heard at the pharma board meetings and it's not a voice that's heard, you know, in government and it is not a voice that is heard, um, you know, very compellingly in any kind of national conversation. In fact, there's a lot in Demon Copperhead about, um, you know, quote unquote rednecks which I did not know that that came from the, you know, the bandanas of the striking miners. We're all learning a lot here. But this idea of, of, of rednecks as being sort of the butt of jokes and certainly as, you know, um, uh, of rednecks as being like at one point he talks about them being the dog, you know, that you have the boyfriend who beats up on the mom and then the mom who yells at the child and the child who kicks the dog. And this very, um, you know, apt analogy of the fact that these impoverished populations are sort of the dog in that analogy, that everyone's having a hard time and they're taking it out on the most vulnerable and the least powerful person. So if you give that va- that, that very um, vulnerable person, you know, despite their resourcefulness and their optimism, they are vulnerable just by dint of their social, you know, standing and their socioeconomic options and the ways the system is is pitted against them if you give that vulnerable individual a voice you are giving voice to many many people it's the adage about if you want to make something kind of general you need to make it very specific so we have this very specific voice here in this demon copperhead person who is you know a descendant of these melungeon people and who is um, a, a unique person and who is uniquely moving through the world and yet because we love this person so much from the start we're able to gain a perspective on this very vulnerable population in a way that is very moving and we don't feel defensive and we don't feel um you know off put and we don't feel alienated uh, it, it, in fact we are really drawn in by this very uh compelling first person narrator so i love that king solver again chose uh david copperfield as her model because it has that first person narrator built in that very vulnerable child boy um, adolescent young man that 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 voice is built into the model we also have this idea of of not having an arc that that these um, the picaresque novel and the realist novel are less interested in kind of the hero's journey um, because it's not about sort of overcoming odds and and ascending to greatness it's it's in fact kind of the opposite which is like literally just trying to stay afloat just no pun intended, you know, because uh, these guys can't drown, what with their calls and whatnot. Um, but you have this idea of of um, of not, th- these are not people who are trying to like achieve greatness and it's not this trajectory aimed towards some goal that they will or will not reach at the end of the novel. This isn't going to be sort of neatly tied up with a bow and a wedding and, and the rest of the things that would come along with, for example, Happily Ever After in a comedy or a romantic comedy sort of novel. What we have here, in fact, is is this testing of the person over and over, which is so apt given uh, the opioid crisis and given how uh, you, the way the system is working against demon makes it, you know, impossible for us to consider him in some sort of heroic arc. We just really want to see him survive. So the last thing I want to do before we close is take a look at a couple of elements in Demon Copperhead. These are at the very beginning of the book, so I'm not spoiling anything. Uh, That seemed to me to be particularly kind of Dickensian and and particularly drawn from uh, David Copperfield in a way that, that didn't 
it didn't interfere at all with my reading of Demon Copperhead. In fact, it made it feel sort of timeless in a way that I really loved. So one of them was these kind of British constructions. And I actually was wondering if King Solver was pulling things verbatim from Dickens. And I did some comparisons and I do not think that's the case. But there are lots of um, examples of syntax like, you've not eaten till you've had that. So th that's a very kind of British way of saying things. Um, or for example, um, uh, you've not seen the far end of lonely. So th this idea of you've not is, is kind of a, a, a more British construction. So I realized when I was um, looking through here and, and reacting to things as British that I don't fully know whether or not those maybe are, are um, dialectical you know, examples from this area. Uh, but I, I don't I don't think so. W what they said to me, and I, I you know I think at this point we can just like go with one reader's reaction here. To me, they did have kind of a timeless kind of British feeling, uh, you know, air to them in a way again that really um, sort of deepened the tie that I felt between the realist novel, in fact, David Copperfield in particular, and Demon Copperhead in a way that I just loved. So. There were lots of examples too that, that felt a tiny bit archaic. So for example, when um, when when Demon arrives at his grandmother's house at Betsy Trotwood's house, um, the description of that could have been the description of Betsy Trotwood in, in, uh, in uh, Dickens. So th there are some elements, you know, obviously a lot of it is placed very firmly in the 21st century. And we have, you know, from the start, we have the, the trailers and we have the smoking cigarettes. Um, happily, this was before a cell phone, you know, before cell phones were really, uh, you know, sort of everywhere because I think it allowed us to kind of um, see this as a little bit more timeless. But it's, you know, there are tons and tons of, of uh, references to actual items and popular culture references that not not too, too many, but but enough to give us a sense that we are, in fact, in this era. Certainly when they start talking about the different kinds of medication and, you know, Oxycontin and the development of Oxycontin and fentanyl patches, you know, then you're very firmly in a certain time frame. Also, you know, just talking about Taco Bell or all these other things, um, you know, you're, you're very firmly situated where you are in time. But it's also layered with this kind of beautiful, somewhat British feeling syntax that does, I think, kind of, it doesn't elevate, it just enriches the prose. So the other thing that uh, King Solver does so incredibly well that is also a Dickens thing is that when you write this first person narrator in a novel like this, you kind of by, by definition are writing in dialect. And so she is writing in this dialect. Some of it's just like American teenager, but a lot of it is specific to this area. And I loved that. So we find out that in fact, Demon is very bright and we find that out in school. And I'm not gonna tell you any more about that in case you haven't read the novel yet. But but we already feel that intelligence um, when when he is a younger person. So we, we have this intelligence that that is very kind of palpable in the voice of the narrator. Part of it's just because this person is wise and, and compassionate and, and partly because we're reading about this story in the first person. It just sort of, you automatically, um, you know, ascribe a certain intelligence to the narrator. But also um, we do have this dialect that is so important because we need to be hearing the authentic voice of someone who is uh, experiencing all of these trials and, and tribulations. So... Um, I, I think the idea of this being in dialect and of, of King Solver as being so good at this dialect and, and at, like kind of young boy dialect, like there's a whole part at one point about football and I was like, who did she consult for this? Like, did you, I mean, she must, well, maybe it's in the acknowledgements, but like a lot of this stuff, you know, just the teenage slang stuff, like I just think she did such a good job of, of uh, you know, I'm imagining a lot of research. I'm not exactly sure where she got all of her dialect from, but she is a native of Kentucky. So, um, you know, it's certainly not too far afield, as it were. Okay. I am going to leave it there, but I really, I thank you for, for tuning in. And um, I just hope that this kind of, you know, quick crash course on Dickens and why 
um, you know, why David Copperfield is such an excellent, excellent uh, sort of precursor to Demon Copperhead. I hope that it only enriches your experience of the novel. Uh, it's not, I don't even think you need to go back and I'm not really actually suggesting that anyone go back and read David Copperfield. I did watch the movie version with Dove Patel by Armando Iannucci, and it's very sweet. Um, it's good. It's very kind of stylized and, and fun to watch. I think it was from a few years ago. I really, really enjoyed that, and I'm definitely going to watch um, the, uh, I think it's The Great Expectations. There's a new BBC version uh, with Olivia Coleman. It got terrible reviews, but it looks excellent to me. I think maybe um, Adam Scott I think that's his name. Um, the no, it's not Adam Scott. I always do this. Um, the sexy priest. Oh my gosh, I'm not gonna remember from Fleabag. You know, my only my favorite. Um, anyway, I'm not gonna remember his name right now. But uh, I think he is also in the Olivia Coleman one. Maybe. Mm. Anyway, I'm gonna be watching some more Dickens on television. I would suggest maybe that instead of diving back in if you're interested in that. If you want a realist novel, maybe go for Madame Bovary, just because it's kind of different and it's um, really delicious and good. And there's an excellent lecture on it at the Fox page. But regardless of, of what you do after you have heard this in terms of realism or the picaresque novel, while we're at it. Um, I, I just really hope that you have gained a bit more from the King Solver because I think it is such an incredible achievement that she has 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 completed and has offered to us. And I hope that lots and lots of people continue to read it and really understand that not only is she fitting herself in this incredibly moving way into this very, very long tradition that speaks to the resilience and the optimism of human beings, um, but that she also has done th this, this incredible job of, of really um, working all of these different aspects in a way that allows us to really appreciate the urgency and, and, and the crushing desperation of people who are, are really fighting against a system that is not working for them. So join me again soon and uh, happy reading. <laughs>